So uh, welcome everybody for the webinar of today. Uh, the speaker of today is, is uh, Stefan Popinet, and the title of his talk is a vertically Lagrangian non-hydrostatic multi-layer model for multi-scale uh, multi free surface flows. As usual, I introduce him very briefly and then uh, uh, leave the stage to, to the speaker. So, uh, Stéphane Popinet is uh, director of the research at uh, CNRS, uh, based at the Institute uh, uh, Jean Beron d'Alembert uh, of uh, Sorbonne Université Paris. Uh, after receiving a PhD in fluid mechanics uh, from Université Pierre and Marie Curie in uh, 2000, he was a research scientist at the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research and IWA in New Zealand until 2013. He is interested in the application of numerical methods for fluid mechanics to understand a range of physical phenomena, including multiphase ocean atmosphere turbulence and transfers, granular materials, microfluidics, uh, tsunamis, and waves. He is also the author of the popular numerical libraries for fluid mechanics, Jerry's and Basilisk, and he is uh, particularly involved in uh, fostering their use by young scientists. It's with great pleasure that uh, uh, we host uh, Stefan Popinet for the webinar of today. So I stop sharing my screen. And uh, Stefan, if you want, you can uh, reshare yours. Okay. Uh, does that look okay? Yeah, we, we see I your screen. screen. Okay. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for the, for the introduction and also for the invitation. Um, to be frank, I had expected at the start that it would be a, not a webinar and I would have been happy that it was not because I'm a bit tired of, uh, of doing stuff on Zoom, but uh, I hope you are not too tired and I will try not to be, to be too long and not to yeah, drag on too long on, on Zoom. But thank you for uh, joining even so you may be a bit saturated with the video conferences. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk maybe, um, yeah, maybe uh, Francesco, if it's okay with you. And, you know, if people want to ask questions during the, during the talk, I mean, don't hesitate to do so. Uh, maybe you raise your hand and maybe Francesco, you can, you can just, uh, you know, uh, give them the, the microphone or something like that. So that's oh, maybe sure. a more interactive. Yes. Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, yes. Okay, so uh, um, I'm going to talk, yes, indeed, about uh, multi layer modeling. So here you see the two keywords in the title, right? Uh, multi layer and multi scale. And I will try to explain uh, why, let's say, these two words are uh, important, generally speaking. Um, okay, so what's the context? Well, we are interested, for example, in large scale uh, ocean atmosphere dynamics. So if you look at uh, you know, classical pictures of the Earth's atmosphere, of course, what is striking about it is that how thin it is. So when you look at this, you say, well, look, the atmosphere clearly is a layer, a very thin layer of fluid um, over the Earth. And, but of course, it's a bit more complicated than that. It's clearly not a single layer. There are probably multiple layers. And if you uh, look, for example, closely at the, at the clouds here, you see that they are indeed fully three-dimensional, right? They are, there is actually no sense that they could be described with a uh, layered uh, layered type model. So clearly, uh, there is always a mixture of, uh, let's say, horizontal scale and anisotropy, if you want, very large horizontal scale compared to small vertical scales. But also, as you zoom in, you must switch from something which is thin layers to something which is essentially fully 3D. So how can you uh, do that in an efficient manner is the general question. Uh, so when you look a bit closely at the Earth, more closely, and you, indeed you can uh, zoom in onto the surface of the ocean in this case, for example, close to the mouth of a river in Hawaii, and I will come back on this, what the people are doing on this, close to this river, um, you see waves, and uh, you see that, again, the waves now are either very, very large compared to their, to their amplitude, let's say, or not so large compared to the amplitude, and you get complex effects like wave breaking, and so on and so forth. So yeah, you have really a range of phenomena. Some of them are governed by, let's say, thin layers, uh, for example, near the beach here, and some of them clearly are not governed by thin layers. So you see this uh, decoupling between the horizontal and vertical scale and recoupling, of course, again, in this example. If you look even more closely, uh, for example, you can look at the behavior of uh, granular materials, which are, for example, in this case, sheared by a wind flow. So here you have the dune forming and you can see the wind blowing over the dune and you can guess that there are 
probably thin uh, boundary layers, okay, and the interaction between this boundary layer and the layer of grain, in effect, is what drives the dynamics of the dunes, and you have uh, secondary instability with the secondary waves on top of the big waves and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So again, here you have a demonstration that um, describing flows as layers, in this case, of course, boundary layers, is an interesting approximation, but you always have to couple this with um, other phenomena which are not occurring in layers. Uh, another phenomenon which we are really interested in is the coupling between, in, for example, here, an idealized representation of the ocean and the atmosphere. And again, you find, again, boundary layers. Typically, here you have sub-layers, which are actually in this, uh, let's say, diagram. And you have coupling with the uh, deeper, or let's say, uh, less flat uh, behavior uh, on top of the wave. So that's also the type of phenomenon we want to study. If you now look even more closely, you can look at a uh, very small scale. So that's the multi-scale, the title. So here we are looking at the classic experiments by uh, Kapitza in the 1940s, I could be there. Uh, and they are really thin films. So here the films are typically uh, sub-millimetric or millimetric in thickness. They can be even thinner than this. And you see these characteristic Kapitza waves, which are uh, governed in effect by a mix of mixture of gravity uh, and surface tension. Uh, so you see, for example, here very clearly dispersive effects, which are linked to the dispersive behavior of uh, capillary waves. So again, here, uh, layered representations are useful, but you are departing from this uh, layered or, let's say, uh, small slope approximation fairly quickly when you study this phenomenon. So of course, this idea of describing fluid flows as layers is not new. Uh, it's, uh, it's been, you know, it's been there for a long time. I'm not sure how long, but clearly at least as long as, uh, as uh, Saint-Venant. Uh, so Saint-Venant uh, actually wrote a famous paper in, uh, in 1871, where he describes the uh, motion of uh, rivers and tides. What's interesting is that uh, you see he wrote that, this uh, when he was, uh, when he was uh, pretty old, because he was born in 1797. So. He wrote that in 1871. Um, so at the end of his career, after his long and distinguished career, is actually some people don't really know, but Saint-Venant also wrote the Navier-Stokes equations, both before Navier and Stokes. So maybe they should be called the Saint-Venant Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, so it was in 1835, so a long time before he wrote this particular paper. So of course, the Saint-Venant equations are, are very classical and well-known. So the idea is that you look at budgets uh, in the thickness of the of the fluid, so you average vertically. That's one way of seeing it. And what you get is um, classic equations. The first equation, of course, is conservation of mass. Second equation is conservation of momentum. And then you have an equation which describes the motion, in fact, which which uh, derives directly the position of the free surface from both the bathymetry and the thickness of the fluid. Okay, so, so from the conservation equation. So what's good about the Saint-Venant equations is that, um, of course, they are simple uh, because now you have reduced the number of dimensions by averaging vertically. Uh, they are a system of conservation laws, which of course is a nice property to have because we like when things are conserved. conserved. Uh, they are fully nonlinear in the sense that, of course, you keep the nonlinear term, so the product, the product of U, okay? You have a very efficient technique to solve them because they are analogous to, well, they are analogous, they are actually the same equations are uh, the equations for compressible gas dynamics. And of course, people have developed numerical methods for uh, compressible gas dynamics for a long time. So uh, they are efficient solvers for this type of equations. So of course, it has drawbacks too. For example, here, the vertical structure is pretty average. So clearly, it's entirely modeled. You make assumptions about what the vertical, for example, velocity profile is. Uh, they are also hydrostatic because there is no vertical acceleration or no vertical momentum or no vertical inertia, which uh, you know, it's the same. Uh, so of course, when you, uh, when you do that, when you do the hydrostatic assumption, what you get is a dispersion relation, C equals square root of GH, which does not depend on the wavelength. So of course, that's the definition of uh, non-dispersive waves. So all the waves, whatever their wavelength, travel at the same speed, which is only governed by the uh, fluid depth. Um, so how can you extend that? How can you lift these limitations? So a very uh, basic idea and simple one is to say, well, of course, we cannot describe the velocity profile, vertical velocity profile with only a single layer. So we are gonna try to couple 
multiple layers together. So that's the picture on the right here. And when you write that, of course, you write conservation equations for each layer. And each of these conservation equations are actually the same as uh, the Savannah equations we saw before, but for each of the layers now. So what you have is a coupled system of conservation equations for each layer. Uh, so what's important about these equations is that they are actually the basis for what uh, ocean and atmospheric model called the primitive equations of oceanic and atmospheric circulation. So they are used in many uh, configurations, typically, uh, particularly for ocean modeling. Uh, and of course, we know they are not really the primitive equations, right? That's how we call them, but because of course, the primitive equations should be made in stock, so they are clearly not out of state, for example. And of course, this has a long history also, so probably you can trace that back to Ray Montgomery, who was one of the first uh, person to think about um, numerically solving uh, meteorological models. So even before, you know, before computers were actually uh, really created. Uh, so he, he basically proposed to uh, solve this type of system numerically, for example, in the 1930s. So what's good about it is that now you have vertical structure, so you can describe vertical velocity profile. Uh, but what's bad about it is that, of course, it's still hydrostatic. Um, so, of course, you don't have a, a more accurate description of the pressure. Uh, and what's also bad about it is that they are not hyperbolic equations in contrast to the single layer Savannah equations. Uh, there are very simple um, reasons why they are not. I'm not, not going to go into detail, but it's interesting enough. And so, um, of course, if you are a mathematician and also if you are a mathematical physicist, you don't really like this type of equations because they can have multiple solutions, which is uh, exactly it's not a well posed problem if you want. Okay, so how can you lift the hydrostatic hypothesis? Um, so one of the again one of the first person to do that was Boussinesque, um, just at the same time as uh, Savonnet was writing the Savonnet equations uh, in 1872. Uh, if you look at the original paper, there are actually some mistakes in it. Um, so for example, I write that it includes the KDV equation, which was uh, derived later by Korteweg and the Ries. It's not uh, quite true uh, because he, uh, he actually has some mistakes in the paper. But still, uh, he introduced uh, basically one of the first, let's say, simplified non hydrostatic dispersive model. And here I have an example of one of the models he proposed. Um, and as you see, uh, what you have in effect is that you have an asymptotic description. So you add terms which are linked to asymptotic expansion. So they look typically like higher order derivatives. And that's what you see here in the two terms. So um, there are many more recent variants of this type of models, right? They are called extended Boussinesque models. For your model, this paper by Say in 1950s, Peregrine in 68, Green and Nagby in the, in the 1970s, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so what's good about these models is that they are uh, non hydrostatic so they produce dispersive waves. So, for example, the dispersion relation for this particular model, what I wrote here, so you see that you have k, right, the wave number, so you have now a dependence on the wavelength of the wave. Uh, so it's, it's good because they can do dispersion, which is, of course, more realistic. Uh, they still have a single layer, as you see, you don't introduce multiple layers, so that's good in the sense it's simpler. Uh, what's bad, of course, is that you get complex asymptotic terms. So, you know, interpreting what these terms mean is not uh, trivial. Uh, it's not a use at all, like in any asymptotic systems, in effect. Uh, you will get high order derivatives, as you can see, you have third derivatives of the velocity, for example, uh, which is not very nice from many points of view, in particular from a numerical point of view. It's not a system of conservation laws anymore. You see, even mass is not conserved, right? Because you have a source term uh, on mass here on the vertical. And you get vertical structure, but only for the pressure, right? You still have, don't have a vertical structure for the velocity. Uh, okay. So of course, what you could do is you could say, well, you know, we know what the primitive system is. It's uh, Navier Stokes, so here, yeah, even if you simplify to remove viscosity, it's uh, Euler. So it's the incompressible Euler equation with the free surface. I wrote, I write here a version of the equation, right? Where you recognize conservation of momentum with here the full pressure and of course gravity. Then you have non-divergence of the velocity. You assume it's an incompressible fluid. And you have the third condition, which is the tricky one, which is the uh, coupling condition for the position of the free surface, chi, and its variation in time. And it's, it's of course, linked to the local uh, velocity of the fluid. And um, these equations were, of course, de derived by Euler in 1777. Uh, so 
uh, of course, a long time ago without the free surface. So the free surface had to wait until the uh, late uh, 18th century, in particular uh, by Lagrange, uh, uh, where from this, um, what are the proper boundary conditions on the free surface. Um, what's good about them is that, of course, they are complete and a consistent system. There is no approximation, let's say, in, uh, in a mathematical sense. Uh, and what's bad about it is that you get a complex boundary condition. So this boundary condition is actually not trivial at all in terms of mathematical structure of the problem. Uh, it's not clear what the link with Savonoi is. So Savonoi is nice because we understand what it means. Right? It means conservation of momentum and mass in, uh, in layers. And we would quite like to see more of this link between the Savonon system and the system. Uh, and from a, let's say, practical or a resolution perspective, uh, we would like to know, uh, uh, understand, or uh, find an approximation for chi uh, using some numerical methods. So here there are, there are a range of methods you can use, but they are all fairly complicated, like volume of fluid, level set, diagonal, etc. And of course, solving them as a high computational cost. So, what can you do about it? Um, so, what I'm, I'm proposing to do is a, an extension, uh, or let's say something which couples um, the various um, advantages of the method I described before. So, what I start with is a, is a layered description. So, here in black, you have the terms which correspond exactly to the uh, hydrostatic multilayer. Uh, case I showed before. So it's the, just the thickness of the layer H and the velocity of the layer, right? And, and of course, if you want to go uh, non hydrostatic you have to add the non hydrostatic terms in blue. And so you have to add W, which is the vertical velocity, which of course you don't have in the hydrostatic approximation. And you have to add phi, which here is the hydrostatic pressure or the hydrostatic pressure divided by the density, right? And that's the variables that you want to add. So if you do that, uh, well, you know, at least you have the number of independent variables that you need to describe the full system. And now each of the layers, of course, has its own vertical position, right? So you are not assuming anything about the position of the layers. The position of the layer is part of the solution also. Um, so if you write the system, sorry, oops. if you write the, the corresponding system, what do you do? You start from um, the multi-layer Simonon system I showed, I showed before, right? So you have conservation of mass in each layer, conservation of momentum. And of course, if you want to add non hydrostatic term, you need to add first an equation for the vertical conservation of momentum, right? And that's what I'm adding here. So here you have now the vertical momentum, right? H times W, the vertical velocity, transport term or ejection term of uh, momentum. And then on the right-hand side, you have the vertical gradient of uh, the non hydrostatic pressure, okay, which I write here in its discrete form. Remember, it's layers. So, in effect, if you do averaging over the layer, what you have is that the net pressure force is just the pressure difference, okay, between the top and the bottom of the layer. This is what this operator expresses, right? This is the top of the layer and the bottom of the layer, okay? So, there's a pressure difference between the top and the bottom of the layer, as you would expect. And of course, you also have to add the pressure on the horizontal, the non hydrostatic pressure on the horizontal gradient, okay, which drives the uh, horizontal moment momentum, okay? So now, of course, you have uh, an issue is that you have phi, you have added a, a variable, and you need to find an equation for this variable, right? So what is the equation to derive a non hydrostatic pressure, which we don't have? Of course, it's the condition of uh, non-divergence of the, of the flow, right? And this is this condition here. Okay, so here it's actually diver divergence of u is equal to zero and expressed again as a discrete expression depending on the layer system that we chose. Okay, so here you recognize the divergence of horizontal velocity. And here again, you have what? You have the contribution of the divergence of the vertical component. You see, there is this additional term which I didn't discuss as well as this one. They are important terms. They are, in effect, metric terms. So they are terms which take into account, as you see here, the gradient of the layer. Okay, and that's the terms which allow you to uh, depart from the assumption that the slope is small. You see that when the slope is small, these terms disappear. But here we keep all these terms. So what we have is, in effect, a system which uh, doesn't make any approximation, of course, aside from the vertical discretization in layers of the full 3D Euler equations. Okay, so this is a consistent discretization of the full 3D Euler equations. Uh, what's nice about it, of course, is that 
um, it's now clearly connected with the simpler hydrostatic system, right? I just showed you that if you start crossing out the terms, then you get back on the black system, which is the standard hydrostatic system. And of course, if you reduce the number of layers, you just go back to one layer, you will get the, just the Saint-Venant system, right? So there is a very clear link between these two, uh, these two systems now. <clears throat> so, of course, it's still a system of discrete conservation laws. Okay, you can check, but everything checks out, right? You are conserving uh, mass and you are conserving horizontal momentum and vertical momentum. Uh, so, that's nice. Uh, and of course, not surprising because it's a consistent discretion of the 3D order equation. So, it has to be a system of conservation laws. Um, it's numerically efficient. I will show you how uh, a bit later. Uh, what's nice too is that it's vertically Lagrangian. You see, it's what I said before is that you see now that the layers, okay, the layer thickness is part of the solution, okay. And you see that if you look at the transport, okay, of the layer, you don't see any terms in W, right? You don't have any terms which correspond to vertical transport, which uh, which seems a bit surprising. It's not surprising, of course, it's because indeed you are Lagrangian in the vertical. So in the vertical, you are just moving the, the layer levels up and down, so there is no flux between layers, okay. So if there is no flux between the layers, indeed there is no vertical flux term okay, in the discretization. So if you want a mixture between horizontally Eulerian discretization, okay, with the corresponding Eulerian uh, flux terms, and a vertically Lagrangian discretization. So what's nice about it, and it's nice because we know that Lagrangian transport is, uh, is accurate, right? It's exactly exact, okay? There is no approximation there. Um, in contrast with what you would do for flux formulation of the Euler equation, where you have to find approximations of the flux, right? And in particular, with this model, you don't get uh, any uh, numerical vertical diffusion because you are Lagrangian in the vertical. This is very important for the ocean models I was talking about before, because uh, in ocean models, it's very important to minimize the numerical uh, vertical diffusion, because in reality, in the real world, vertical mixing in the ocean is very, very low. So if you have numerical diffusion, you will get just too much vertical mixing compared to what happens in the ocean, which, for example, remains stratified due to temperature differences uh, for a very long time. So you will not be able to maintain this very important uh, stratification balances if you have too much numerical diffusion. And this is a big issue for, for example, climate modeling of the ocean. So this, this is a big advantage of this formulation in this context. Uh, and I put also a minus is because now you have to do something, okay, with Lagrangian methods, if you get layers which are too thin, for example, which collapse onto one another, or on the contrary, which become much too broad, right, you have to do something, you have to redistribute the layers. So there is some operation that you have to do there, but it's not such a bad point in this case, because it's only uh, Lagrangian in one dimension, okay, so there's redistribution in 1D, is much easier to do than uh, in 2D or 3D, of course. So it's not that hard a problem to solve. Okay. Now, of course, it has a big drawback is it is that too, it has too many unknowns. Okay. Why? Because if you look now, I've introduced new unknowns, right, which are the k plus one half and k minus one half variables. Okay. So I need to close the system by linking, linking for example, the mean pressure, okay, in the layer to the pressure on the top and the bottom of the layer. Okay. So, so the question is, how do you do that? How do you close this, this system? So what scheme do you use to in effect compute k plus one half from the average in each of the layers, okay? So it turns out it's a, it's a very classical problem. Even so the model I'm proposing is not that classical. Um, there are, you know, there are issues about how do you choose vertical discretization of this layered model, even the, in the hydrostatic ones. So it did best to, again, the early days of numerical weather predict prediction. And there is this famous paper by Edward Lawrence. So Lawrence is, of course, the same uh, Lawrence that did the Lawrence attractor okay, of chaotic system. So the prediction that indeed the weather systems were chaotic system. Okay? And it's in this paper, the same paper. So of course, it was a long paper, right? And we had many things in it. It's called Energy and Numerical Weather Prediction. I recommend you read it. It's very uh, it's fascinating uh, to see how he thought about it at the time. So it's from 1960. And I described uh, his simplify model. And it also talks about how to best uh, describe vert these vertical layers. And he proposes to use this type of grid, OK? So where you discretize the pressure on the layer, and then you discretize the vertical velocity in a staggered way, OK? So you have the vertical velocities are on the layer interface, 
and the pressure are in the middle. Okay, there are reasons why you want to do that. I won't go into the details because it's a bit uh, numerical. Okay, but that's a very classical discretization, which is used now also in numerical weather prediction models. Okay. So something a bit different, which is much less common, okay, is uh, based on this paper by Keller okay, from 1971, so also a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> and in the, this paper, it says actually for some system which have nothing to do a priori with weather prediction, he was not interested in weather prediction, he was interested in parabolic problems, okay. He showed that this discretization where you actually collocate the pressure and the vertical velocity at the same location, so at the interfaces between layers, okay, has uh, significant advantages and also significant drawbacks compared to you know, the Lorentz grid, because you didn't know about Lorentz, but compared to doing it this way. And that's also taken up in this more recent paper by uh, Zijanma and, and Stellen. Okay. So, um, so in effect, we can choose either of these two discretizations to close the system, I should be sure, so to to have uh, enough equations uh, compared to our unknowns. Okay, so a question is how do you choose, how do you differentiate between the two? Okay, so the idea here to, to pick the best one, okay, of these two uh, is to uh, compute the discrete dispersion relation. So the dispersion relation of our layered system. So to do that, you do that in a very classical way. Uh, you uh, you linearize okay the system, so you introduce uh, a height layer height, which are just um, you know perturbations to a mean height plus uh, you know, cosine sine functions uh, times uh, um, h prime, which is a small perturbation, and you do the same of course for each of the variable h u and phi and so on and so forth. Okay, if you do that, it's very classical. You find this system and you recognize it's the same system but now linearized okay and expressed in the in the perturbation variables okay h prime and u prime and so on so forth the first equation is still the uh, conservation of mass okay linearized conservation of mass the second one is still the linearized conservation of horizontal momentum the third one is linearized uh, discretization of vertical momentum okay and the last one is the linearized divergence equation it's very easy to recognize it right you see here you have the derivative u prime ki is the horizontal derivative of the velocity and the volume prime minus is just the difference of the velocity on, on both layers okay so here you see i have k and k minus one okay i don't have the k plus one half and k minus one half anymore why it's because in this case i chose uh, the discretization of Lorentz. okay so now now i have an explicit relation between wk and wk uh, um, i plus one okay um, so I have this system, and in a very classical way, I compute the determinant of the system, and this gives me the, the discrete dispersion relation, okay? And for this system, if I have two layers, of course, it depends on the number of layers, okay? I get this dispersion relation, so omega 2 squared, okay, is function of the wave number is equal to this. Uh, what does it look like? Well, you see, it's a, it's a rational uh, expression, and you see you have terms here, which are depends on k to some power, okay? And the power of k you get here, so the expansion in effect you get, the higher the number of layer, the more terms you get, okay, and the closer you get to the true uh, expansion of the hyperbolic tangent function in effect, which controls the true dispersion relation, okay. So that's for a particular model, you can do that for any models, and you can study how it depends on the number of layers, and how you converge to the true dispersion relation with the number of layers, okay. So that's what I show in this graph. So here on the horizontal axis, you have kh, okay, so the wave number times the um, times the local death, okay, and of course we know that for true waves, for real waves, the dispersion relation is, is this, right, c squared, the wave speed is proportional to uh, hyperbolic tangent of kh, right, it's the true dispersion relation, okay. And here, what I've done, I have computed using uh, my discrete dispersion relation, I've computed the speed, okay, so the discrete uh, dispersion relation speed, and divided it by the exact one, which is this one, okay, so an ideal model would sit on one, okay, would just be straight on one. So what you see what happens with the, in this case, the Lorentz discretization with one, two, three, and four layers, okay, is that as you have, if you have a wave which is uh, very long compared to the depth, okay, where you have a long wave, then you have a very accurate dispersion. You have, in effect, no dispersion, so you have something which is uh, very close to one. And as the waves become shorter and shorter, okay, they become more and more dispersive, and it becomes harder and harder to describe them, okay. And then, of course, you see it departs from the 
from the IDO. You see the variation is not much, right? It's just plus or minus 4%, yeah? But you see that by the time you add k equals to 10, you don't have an accurate description anymore, okay? Of the, of the waves. So you cannot do very short waves. Very short here for kh, remember there's a two pi factor. So k equals 10 is a wave which has a wavelength which is comparable to the depth, which is not that short in effect, right? So even that you cannot really do. And what you see, what's more, what you see is that the Lorentz discretization converges very slowly, right? If it's one layer, two, three, four. So you see that if you want to go to k equals to 10 with this type of model, you will really need to increase to go to 100 layers or more, right? To get accurate description. So clearly it's not a very nice uh, convergence property. Now I'm showing you the other discretization I showed before, okay, which is the Keller discretization. So it's, it's simple enough, right? It's just a change of indices in effect, okay? You describe the relation between K and K plus one half. It's just a different one. Uh, and you see that already it's, uh, it's much, much better, right? The behavior is different. It's not monotonic anymore, okay? But you see that now with only uh, four layers, okay? You can describe waves which are good to catch about um, more than 50. Okay, so you see that it makes a big difference which discretization you choose and the accuracy of your dispersion relation. So then the question is, can you do better than this? Um, so I'm just comparing here with other type of models. So here I'm going away, to, I'm going back to, let's say, the more classical Boussinesque type model. Okay, and this Boussinesque model are considered to be, let's say, the state of the art in modeling uh, shorter waves, okay, for uh, wave type models. And here, for example, I show you the optimized green leg with only one layer. So you see, it's pretty good that there's only one layer, but still, it's limited to also uh, reasonably long waves. Uh, and now I'm showing you something which is much better, which is a two layer Boussinesque model. Okay, so it's probably the best you can do with Boussinesque model. You see, it's almost perfect, right up to k equals 10, and then it departs from that. Okay. Uh, what you have to realize, of course, is that these models are asymptotic two layer models. So they are much, much more complicated than the Boussinesq model I showed you before, which already was fairly, fairly uh, tricky to, to understand. Okay, but so what you see is that with the scalar model, we don't do quite as well as the fully uh, two layer, the best, let's say, Boussinesq model uh, out there, but it's very, it's very close. Right? We get something which is, which is very good for this type of, uh, of ways. Um, you can do even better. So here, yeah, what I choose for the Keller model, okay, is that I choose to increase the number of layers, but just distribute them uh, homogeneously in the vertical, okay? So you could say, oh, maybe that's not optimal. Maybe you can use a distribution on the vertical, which is not uniform, right? For example, you could um, put more layers close to the surface, and maybe that would give you better dispersion relation. So of course, once you have, if you, if, if I go back to the, I go back to the previous slide. Okay, this one you see depends, uh, of course, on the number of layer, but also on the thickness H1, H0, right? Is the basic thickness of the layer. So here you have a prediction of actually what I just said before, which is the accuracy of um, the dispersion relation as a function of how the layers are, dis are distributed. So you can do that. You can use that to optimize the dispersion relation, okay? So here I take a three layer model, but I distribute the layers not uniformly. And you see with that, I get a dispersion relation which is a bit more complicated, right? Goes up and down, but still up to uh, KH equals 60, uh, you can you get less than 1% error in the dispersion uh, velocity, okay? So you can really do a very accurate dispersion with this type of model. Okay, so how do you use this model in practice? So uh, you, well, at some point you use numerical methods, right? And uh, so I'm using Basilisk, which is the code which uh, I've developed with many other people for many years now. Uh, it uses quad of tree adaptive mesh refinement, which I summarize here. It does MPI and open MP and all this, so this, this sort of uh, well, fancy things. Um, and what maybe the important point is that you can go on the website uh, Spotify, and you will see it's uh, it's uh, it's well documented and uh, it's uh, used to do uh, reproducible research in the sense that many people publish also the code that they wrote together with the paper and so you can use the paper and then reproduce their results using the code which is on the website so uh, a friend of mine was nice and he said oh it's the wikipedia of food making it's where you can redo the experiments uh, yourself i'm not quite sure it's on the level of wikipedia but uh, that's sort of the idea. Okay, so what can you will do with that? I will just show you an example of um, 
for example, you can use it to uh, simulate uh, tsunamis. So here, what I'm showing you is the uh, Japanese tsunami of 2011, the one which uh, destroyed the uh, Fukushima uh, power station. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how multi-scale this is, typically the, this is the spatial extent, right? You recognize Japan here, which is here at Kamchatka, which is not very well resolved, right? And the spatial resolution varies from one to 250 kilometers. That's what you have on the right here. So the dark blue is 250 kilometers, and that dark red is one kilometer. Um, so if you use this model, you, see, you get that, right? And so you see the, in effect, the initial uh, displacement, okay, traveling. Of course, the speed of travel is uh, dependent on the web depth, but also on the wavelengths. And you see dispersive effects quite clearly from the, yeah, the, at the train of the, of the tsunamis. And of course, you see interaction with the islands. And on the right hand side, you see the, the mesh size being refined in effect, okay? So you see that the mesh adaptively refine and tracks the waves as they travel and bounce back. So here you can see the wave bouncing back from a collision with apples and so on and so forth. Uh, I won't have time to go into the details of this, but of course we can really uh, study uh, quite closely what happens to the waves compared with, uh, compared with field measurements and so on and so forth. And there are papers where uh, we did that. Uh, okay. And uh, I did really, we, I actually did that with several models with the green NACD model we saw before and also with the Simon model. So you could say, well, you know, are dispersive effects really important? So you can actually look at the influence of dispersion, right? I insisted that having dispersive models is useful. Um, what's interesting for tsunamis is that many, of, um, quite often, you will hear people say that tsunamis are not dispersive waves or that they are mainly non dispersive or that they are dispersive only close to the coastline, right? Uh, this is this is wrong in general. Is that dispersion is important even in deep water, and that's what you see here, right? So here you have a comparison of the say green like this, so the bushiness type model, if you want, on the left column here. Yeah, with the zoom uh, here, you have the one layer non aerostatic model. So you can actually do uh, the model I showed before. You can really run it on only one layer with the non aerostatic term, right? And you see that indeed the solutions are quite close. You have a longer dispersive wave train. For the uh, non aerostatic model, is because it's less dissipated than the green NACD model for the same resolution. And on the right hand side, you have the hydrostatic equivalent. So you see right away that dispersion is indeed important. Um, of course, the position of the main front is not affected much, right? But you see that the later waves are quite affected, and also the amplitude of the wave front is quite different, right? You have a much lower amplitude for the dispersive model than for the non hydrostatic model. So, of course, if you are Looking into impacts of waves, okay, tsunami uh, waves for their yeah, possible destructive impacts, then this uh, difference in amplitude is, is quite is quite important, right? Um, okay, and uh, the speed of computation is uh, is interesting, and you see that the fastest model is also the non hydrostatic model. What may be surprising is that it's actually faster than the hydrostatic model. So that you see how you are adding terms, and yet you go you are faster computationally. How is that? Um, the explanation is simple enough is that because you have dispersion, okay, the wave speed of a dispersive wave is necessarily less than the wave speed of the non dispersive waves. Okay? And since you have a safe air condition on uh, the transport of this wave or the speed of these waves, okay, you can use a much larger time step for the dispersive model than for the non dispersive one. So not only the dispersive model is more accurate because the velocity is more physically correct, but it's also faster because the waves go slower in deep water. That's the explanation on why it is also faster to compute. Of course, you can get details of flooding. So you can do uh, flooding and drying. So yeah, I, I put a detail of one of the areas which was the most uh, affected is the Sendai Plain, which is in the Tohoku district. Fukushima is around here, somewhere here. And you see, we can actually get, even at this fairly close resolution of one kilometer, we can do higher resolution, but you also get the flooding and uh, wetting and drying of the, uh, uh, of the plane. So we can predict in fact, the impact of these two waves. So now I'm, I'm going to switch scales completely, okay, go multi-scale way, and I'm going to look at a much uh, smaller scale. So here, for example, you have a bump, okay, which is typically 30 meter long. Okay, and which where you have the flow, which is typically one meter deep. Okay, so here we are clearly in the not in the hydrostatic limit, okay, and not in the limit where the slope is small. Okay, so we are looking at something where the vertical scale here becomes comparable to the horizontal scale. So we are really moving moving away, let's say, from the Saint-Venant shallow water 
or layered type complex. And we are going to see whether that's, you know, we can deal with this type of flows with this particular description. So what you have on top uh, is a comparison with the multi-layer hydrostatic, okay? And I said before that you have efficient models for compressible gas dynamics, and typically these models are based on Riemann solvents, okay? So I'm, yeah, I'm just comparing the two, and you see that indeed the hydrostatic model, okay, can do shocks in effect, but typically what you have is a shock, it's a dissipative shock, but it is a shock, okay? As well, let's say, as a Riemann solver, so, so the base uh, solvers. So we recover some of the properties, or many of the properties of, let's say, compressible uh, gas dynamics, also with this uh, simpler, in many ways, uh, multi-layer model. So this is the hydrostatic version. So remember, a nice thing about this model is that you can turn the terms uh, on and off. Um, so you can uh, you can make it hydrostatic just by turning off one term, and that's, of course, transparent in the code. You can switch on the term. Uh, so that's a nice feature. So what happens now if you, uh, if you add the if you had the non hydrostatic terms, okay, well, you, of course, the solution now becomes very different, right? Why? Because now you have vertical inertia, okay, and in effect, because you have vertical inertia, you get oscillations in the free surface, and of course, that's of how you get dispersive rates, right? It's because you cannot relax towards the uh, non dispersive velocity fast enough, okay, because you have vertical inertia, and so you create another uh, characteristic time, okay, uh, which gives you the secondary wavelengths that we see here, okay. Um, and so what I do here is that I compare the multi-layer non hydrostatic formation, I said before, with a completely different model, okay, which is a Navier-Stokes volume of fluid solution. Okay, so it's another solver which is also written in Basilisk. And uh, what's nice, of course, that now you cannot see the difference between the two. Okay, so this goes to toward proving the claim that uh, you know I claimed before that the multi-layer discretization is. Uh, a, a discretization of the incompressible Euler, in this case, the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. So you see that indeed, it seems to be at least numerically uh, consistent because you get solutions which are very close between the full Navier-Stokes system, okay, with the volume of the description. And, uh, but you may say, well, you know, what's the use of that? You know, if you get the same solution, why not just use the Navier-Stokes solver? And of course, the answer is that this runs in three minutes and this runs in one hour, okay? So there are two differences. There is a practical difference, of course, it's much faster, but there's also a formal difference in the sense that this you can test within the framework of layered flows and how far you are from saint venant and so on and so forth, and how uh, linked it is to the classical theory that you know, which are based on layers, whereas, of course, this is much harder to do. Okay. Here, yeah, in this case, for example, you cannot really switch the hydrostatic term at will and so on, uh, uh, well and so on and so forth. So this model has many, let's say, formal advantages and also, of course, a big practical advantage is that it runs much faster than the, than the other one. Um, okay, so I'm going back to the picture I showed before. So what were these guys in Hawaii doing? Well, they were doing that, they're actually surfers, right? And they dug through the sandbar, if you remember the river we saw before. And of course, you have all the water is, is rushing through and these guys are surfing the dispersive waves, okay, which are uh, generated by the flow of this uh, outflow of this river into the sea, okay. And uh, of course, it's a nice illustration that these waves are indeed uh, dispersive and non-hydrostatic, right, uh, because typically these guys can surf only because the vertical acceleration of the wave is comparable to gravity, right. So clearly the vertical acceleration is not negligible to pr compared to gravity. And that's why I would can surf, and that's why these waves are dispersive and uh, non hydrostatic. But of course, this guy don't really know that. Also, they know how to surf the wave. Okay, so can you go further? Can you push the code even further? And uh, here, what, what we do is that we, um, so we are interested in studying uh, breaking waves, in particular because uh, breaking is thought to control um, a large part of the transfer of gas and also of momentum between the ocean and the, and the atmosphere, okay? So we have been studying breaking for a while now using, um, again, Navier-Stokes uh, rough type solution. So yeah, I'm gonna compare a breaking wave. So clearly here yeah, we go well beyond the, let's say the simpler assumption because now the, not only the, uh, of course the slope is not small, but the wave is even overturning, okay? You will see that happening. And of course our code, which is based on layers cannot do overturning, okay? 
So here we are pushing it beyond what it can do because it cannot describe uh, overturning. And the question is, does it? What does it do? Okay. So I'm just going to show you. So I remember the top is the Navier Stokes, and at the bottom is the layer. So you see at the start, uh, the evolution looks very very close, and then at, now at the top it's breaking. Okay, you have a breaking wave at the top with, of course, overturning the formation of uh, of cavities, which you don't have in the multi-layer solver. You cannot have. But you see that you get something which is close to a shock with strong dissipation. And you even have structures which uh, are shed from the crest, which looks very much like the structure which are shed in the fully uh, Navier-Stokes uh, Voss solver, right? So it looks very, um, well, you know, the only thing I can say for the moment, because we haven't pushed the, really the study far enough, is that it does look very realistic. Of course, the initial evolution is very, very close. And we check that indeed the initial evolution before breaking is indeed very, very close between the two, the two models. Um, OK, so what's, uh, again, what's good about this is that, uh, oh, OK, maybe I'll show you. OK, so can you do it in 3D? So yeah, I'm showing you that in the same thing, right? We are initially initializing a steep wave, and it's breaking, but now it's in three dimension. So you have this wave train, and again, you see the same sort of phenomenon. Now you see the wave breaking, OK? So you have the invincible crest. And you get uh, you get breaking, which does look realistic. You even have you see, you transition to turbulence, right, inside the, the band layers, which are formed inside the fluid. Right? And that's why you get this turbulent flow. And you have these interesting structures, which uh, which actually look quite realistic with the ear secondary breaking, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, you see that in in no case does the surface overturn. Right, you have no overturning. What happens, of course, is that you get, uh, like in any code which tries to resolve a uh, shock or a discontinuity, you get regularization of the discontinuity by numerical viscosity, okay? which is what happens also in, uh, in classical shock capturing schemes, for example. And that's what we get here. And that's how we can uh, robustly compute something which goes even beyond breaking. Um, and of course, what's good about it is that uh, it's very fast, right? You get this type of 3D solution uh, runs in 13 minutes on, uh, on you know, a small, small machine, let's say, with a resolution which is not negligible, which allows you to accurate, accurately capture, for example, the transition uh, to turbulence in the band layers, right? Also, it's helped by the fact that you can put more grid points on the set, put layers which are thinner close to the, to the top of the surface. Um, okay, so just to give you some uh, conclusions, uh, so I've presented a semi-discrete consistent representation of the compressible Navier Euler Navier Stokes equation with a free surface. What's nice about it is that you can link it very directly between, uh, you can make the link between the classic, let's say, Euler Navier Stokes, the Savonard and Boussinesque equation. So that's, so that's nice from a formal perspective and also from a, um, let's say when you are studying systems, okay, you like writing simplified equations. And here you can write these this simplified equations, study them theoretically, and also solve the their equivalent formulation uh, numerically. So that's a, that's a nice way, let's say, to bridge the gap between um, theoretical and mathematical derivations and the actual applications to complex problems where your hypotheses are breaking, for example, of uh, asymptotic uh, hypotheses are breaking. You can make this link seamlessly between the various models. Um, so um, I hope I sort of uh, started to convince you that this the same model can be applied to wells which range from meter scale, okay, like the waves we showed at the, at the end breaking, to kilometer scale, so even thousands of kilometer waves like the tsunami wells I showed before. So there are many extensions we are working on at the moment. So yeah, what I show you is only a free surface, okay? So we are working on cases where now you have a true interface. So you have fluids on either side of the free surface I showed before. Uh, we are working also on surface tension extension and uh, lubrication equations. So that's more linked to the, to the Kapitza waves from what I showed before. And that's the PhD of uh, Clément Robert, uh, supervised with Arnaud and Kobiak here in the lab. Uh, and we are also working on adding, you know, large scale effect like Coriolis and forces, geostrophic balance, and that's uh, for applications to uh, ocean large scale, let's say, ocean modeling. Uh, and if you want more details, there's, there's of course the Basilisk website where you have a lot of uh, information, and also this uh, JC2 paper which describes very much the uh, formulation I have uh, just shown in this seminar. And I thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
So thank you very much, Stefan, for uh, uh, for your presentation. And uh, as you said, uh, the stage is open for questions. So please, to the participant, feel free to unmute your mic and ask a question. Although you, oh, hello. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, can I, uh, uh, this is Alan Kirstein, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, yeah. Oh, good, very good. I yeah. really, really enjoyed to talk very much. And I'm, I'm wondering about, um, just two questions about possible extensions. Uh, of course, you're addressing surfaces, but when you have multi-layer, then there's a possibility in the in, uh, intermediate layers that you're also seeing internal waves. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you've thought about that phenomenology. And my second question is, so then you can ask, oh, ask both of them perhaps. When you see the wave, uh, sort of uh, the, the development of turbulence, of course, you, you don't see overturns. Therefore, you don't see actual turbulent mixing but it seems that you have a very efficient framework for possibly supplementing it with a more empirical type of turbulent mixing model uh, in order to get then the internal uh, mixing result that would result from the overturns that you can't uh, literally resolve. So okay. those are my two points. Uh, that's, that's a very, very uh, good point. Uh, very good question. Thank you. Um, you have to be, uh, you know, it has to be clear that um, the limitation on overturning only apply to the free surface, right? Because, um, so what I said before is that the layers uh, are Lagrangian, okay, but they can be redistributed. They can, they have to be redistributed in effect. So the, the top layer, of course, cannot be moved because it is a material surface. Okay, it's part of the solution. But the interior layers can be moved at will, right? It's just a choice of discretization. So it means that you can perfectly have overturning, if you want, uh, inside the fluid. So the mixing uh, inside, below the free surface, okay? You have a full description of mixing. There is no approximation. There is no limitation in, in the amount of overturning, if you want, you can have within the fluid itself, okay? It's only the free surface which can overturn. So you will get, for example, fully, um, you can get uh, vortices inside. You know, what I mean is you can get vertical vortices inside the fluid, right? You get them actually, if you like, if I'm like, I can go back to this, um, I go back to this case, right? You see here, you have recirculation, right? This is a recirculation bubble. So here you have a full uh, 3D field, which has no limitation on overturning, right? It's only the free surface which cannot overturn. So that, that's so for your second point. For the first point, it's the same for, if you want for internal waves, it's the same thing. If you add stratification to this flow, you will get also a full description of the stratified flow, right? You can have, uh, there's no approximation, there's no limitation on how stratification is described and how much overturning you can get in terms of stratification. So you can get resolution of, um, of internal waves uh, with this model with no, no, no limitation in effect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so any more questions, just uh, feel free to unmute your mic. In the meantime, I can report a question which is uh, in the chat. So uh, what is the downstream boundary condition for the flow over the bump? Uh, initial water depth or no water? Uh, mm -hmm. Do the numerics capture the transient when the pump is uh, turned on uh, and the reverse tidal bore is generated at the bump front? So here the boundary, uh, of course, it's a very good question because uh, the, the, the solution uh, for this problem is very much driven by the boundary condition. Uh, so here, if I remember correctly, what, we, what I impose, I impose the flow rate, right? So the flow rate is set and the outflow height is, is set also, okay? So here we set the outflow boundary, if you want the outflow thickness, right? And we set the, we set the flow rate. And then the solution adjusts to uh, this particular type of solution. Of course, it would be different. If you change the boundary condition, you can get very different. Uh, it's actually a tricky problem to solve uh, because the, for example, here, the position, the existence and the position of the, of the shock depends on the dissipation property. So you see here, you have viscosity, right? So this is the velocity. So you see it goes to zero because you have 
um, low sleep condition in the wall, right? So the, the actual solution depends on boundary conditions, fluoride, of course, at height here, and also on the viscous dissipation, so also on viscosity. Okay, thanks. I think that uh, actually uh, did reply to the question and uh, actually a comment of the same uh, participant is it seems to be equivalent uh, to have an initial water depth experimentally. Uh, it's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I experimentally, I'm not, yeah, I'm not fully sure how you would do it, but uh, <laughs> maybe, uh, well, no, I think maybe experimentally you would use, um, you would use a weir, right? The weir, 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 weir at the end, right? You would fix the, not, I'm not quite sure, but uh, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the, I think the answer was uh, was quite was very clear, and let, let's see if there is someone else who would like to ask a question. So once again, just feel free to unmute your mic and uh, ask the question if you have any. Okay, then maybe I can I can ask one. Um, so. Uh, the, uh, you, you talked about uh, uh, about the uh, flooding uh, when you considered uh, uh, like the tsunami of uh, the Fukushima, mm -hmm. yeah. Fukushima, the, 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 like the uh, and the uh, question is uh, how do you uh, model the, the the flooding actually because you you must have like an interface which is moving on a uh, as far as I understand, on a, on a dry uh, soil, right? Yes. So it's um, well, it's, it's something which is um, you know which has been um, well studied now is the consistency or not uh, mm -hmm. of the of the shallow water Simon equations or equivalently of the of the compressible gas dynamic equation. Okay, when the density or the height goes to zero. Actually, you can show that the seminar equations are consistent for even for what depth which goes to zero, right? Ah. So there's no, they in effect, no issue with uh, wetting and drying is considered if you talk to ocean model as a difficulty from a mathematical standpoint and for seminar equations, right? There is no difficulty in the sense that the equations are well posed when the thickness goes to zero, right? Of course, numerically, you have to be careful not to divide by zero and things like that. But in effect, that's, that's just what we do is that we are careful not to divide anywhere by zero and the solution behaves properly because mathematically it is well posed. So there is nothing special to do to get a robust solution for wetting and drying for this system. That's also why I showed that it can do that because people uh, sometimes consider it's difficult to do. It's actually fairly easy to do in this, uh, in this system because again, it is consistent. But in that case, somehow the link between uh, uh, the multi-layer um, non-hydrostatic uh, uh, model and the Navier-Stokes is somehow partially broken because you don't have like you it, it like the 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 link between the two kind of breaks down when you don't have any more the triple phase contact line problem, right? Yes, exactly. Well, that's that's very good point. So indeed. Uh, it works because you reduce the system, and in fact, even numerically, you reduce the system to the Simonon system, right? That's what I was yeah. saying. And so, because the Simonon system is well posed for um, zero density, then you are, you are fine. But, uh, but you are perfectly right that there is something very, uh, actually, very interesting and not uh, fully understood to, uh, to study, where you study the limits of Navier Stokes in the, same, uh, in the same configuration, in particular, in relation with the contact time problem. Yeah. Uh, so yes, that's a very interesting area, which uh, I think people uh, haven't really looked enough at, and that's something we want to look at also. The link between them. Okay. Okay. So uh, in my in my mind, I interpreted it as as like a boundary condition, like uh, uh, having a Navier uh, condition with a parameter somehow that controls the slip right when you have like thin films. And you kind of switch from no slip to 
to fully sleep or to from Naverstokes to San Venant. Mm. Uh, but I don't know if this is a correct interpretation. I was just uh, speculating. Well, about. it's it's around these lines, but I don't think this link is very clear at the moment. Yeah. So that's exactly the sort of link which uh, needs to be clarified, right? I don't think at the moment the, the transition between the two is understood. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so any more uh, uh, questions from the participants? Maybe um, you can just once again, either write in the chat and they will report a question or um, uh, post a question, just unmuting your mic and uh, feel free to post a question. Uh, I see something written in the discussion. Uh, yeah, there is there is actually a question in the discussion. So um, uh, the question is, I was wondering if you, uh, I was wondering how you consider the turbulence in fact effect in a multi-layer free surface model. In addition, regarding the AMR, if the mesh is refined near the free surface, how about large scale vertical structure in engineering turbulent flows? Um, so it's a good question, but it's, uh, in effect, the, there is no, um, if you want, there is no uh, fundamental difference between um, between the, this multi-layer formulation and any other, even a nine-layer formulation. So you have the same uh, the same issues, uh, the same difficulties, let's say, in parameterizing uh, turbulence. But also, you can apply very much the same approaches. There is no not really any limitation to what you can do. It's an advantage of this formulation is that you can, uh, for example, um, of course, you can uh, more easily describe uh, boundary layers. Okay, and you can also study well, a big issue you have, for example, when you try to model turbulent uh, wave breaking, uh, is you want to derive simplified uh, dissipation model linked to the breaking, and uh, and of course that's hard to do. What you can do in this framework is that you can actually study. Uh, more directly, uh, this type of effect. So you can have try to do direct simulation of the of the breaking or unstable boundary layers and derive a dissipation terms from that. So this formulation can help you in effect derive uh, turbulence models linked to uh, stabilization of the uh, boundary layers near breaking waves, for example. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any more questions from Aya? Ah, yeah. uh, so there is another one. Are you planning to include the effect of surface tension or is it forbidden for the structure model? Uh, but, so yes, that was in my conclusion slide. So that's something we already have. So we have, uh, we have a surface tension model already. And uh, there, there are nice, uh, nice aspects to it. For example, it's, uh, yeah, you can get uh, more accurate for the description of surface tension with this type of uh, of representation than you would with, uh, for example, uh, let's say more general uh, schemes like volume of speed or let's say. So yeah, you can, and that's not surprising because you are again writing the equations using the um, referential or the coordinate systems, which uh, makes it easier to, to deal with uh, surface tension terms, for example. Another nice thing you can do and which we, we have done is that you can uh, use uh, implicit time implicit discretization of surface tension. So you can get unconditional stability for thin films, which is a big issue for uh, when you start doing uh, low capillary number flows like uh, you know, very viscous, um, very viscous uh, surface tension driven flows like what you have in microstudies and so on. Uh, so that, that's another advantage of this type of models. Okay, okay. Um, okay, uh, so uh, any more questions from uh, from the audience? Uh, no, this doesn't seem to to be the case. I just have one last. Uh, uh, question regarding like the limitation of such an approach. Basically, the only limitations as far as I understand uh, is related to, um, to, the, uh, to the free surface and to the, 
to the substrate, which should be somehow, uh, let's call it like this function of z of, of x. They, mm -hmm. they cannot, uh, that's, that's basically the only limitation to such an approach, right? That's right, yes. I recently learned that this type of uh, description, so essentially the, when you say that uh, something must be the graph of a function, right? it's called yeah. a, Mons, a Mons representation, so Mons was a mathematician, of course, and um, that's, that's what it's called about in mathematics, it's called the Mons representation of the surface, so yes, the free surface must be a graph of a function, so it can have a term, and the bottom also, yeah. But the, the, indeed, that's the only uh, the only uh, limitation. And the rest, you don't have approximations on the on the terms. Right? You, you don't assume, for example, that the slopes are small and so on. So, forth. so basically, it has the same uh, uh, kind of limitations a Navier-Stokes solution would have if you consider your domain and you map it in a square, which can only be deformed in vertical direction. That's right. Yes. So of course, there are connections with you know. Let's say layer in, uh, you know, arbitrary and Lagrangian variance schemes and so on and so forth. So you have range of models. But here, the nice thing about this particular version, let's say, the one I propose, is that you can really tighten and uh, with the with the the Saint Venant systems and so on and so forth. So you can simplify it so that you go continuously almost from Navier Stokes down to a simpler system. Okay. 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 Very nice. Uh, the there is actually another question in the discussion. Uh, owing to the Lagrangian treatment, are these advantages? Uh, 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 are there advantages for advecting dispersed phases? Uh, it's a good so it's, so yeah. I mean that's a good good point. Um, indeed, if you transport the the transport, you know, the Lagrangian transport is only in the vertical, so it's it's going to make a difference only if you are your structure that you want to preserve, of course, is a vertical structure, okay? If you, if you transport dispersed, horizontally dispersed thing, then, then you know, you are, you are doing it alarian, so you have the same disadvantages that you have for any horizontal alarian formulation. It's only vertical, like Rangian in the vertical. But for example, if you have a very stratified or even two-phase flows in the vertical, okay, you have, a, let's say, an oil layer and a water layer, Okay, superimpose or more layers than that with different properties, then you can start treating the, the interfaces as material interfaces as you do to, for, the, for the free surface, right? And that's what I was talking about before is that the generalization of this model is where you can treat, and we can do it even now, you can treat uh, each uh, layer as a material interface which would separate miscible phases. And of course, in this case, you are much more accurate than if you do it dispersive using a diffusive model, right? Uh, if, if your phases are layered and non-diffusive with this system, you have uh, very accurate solutions, which you cannot have with a, an layer model. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks for, for replying to so many questions. Uh, as you could see, uh, the uh, the discussion was very active um, and uh, thanks for the very interesting and well, uh, uh, very well presented in seminar today. I think it was very, very clear. We didn't have any question during the presentation and uh, all the uh, questions at the end were very much on, uh, on, on the topic. So that's, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. For, thank, you. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for attending and uh... Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, again, I know how uh, it can be a bit um, long and boring to be listening to Zoom <laughs> talks. So thank you again for staying until the end. It was great. Thanks again. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I hope to see you all once again next Thursday. And uh, um, thank you for, uh, for attending today. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.